Hello everyone, welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday the 12th of September. Today's topic is Music Can Move Us with Lodge McCammon. Our, your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, and Tammy Moore. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning. And I'm actually going to turn the mic over to Paula Noggle, who will introduce Dr. McCammon for us and also ask the newbie question. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live. I am so excited to do the intro for Dr. Lodge. Dr. Lodge McCann's career began in 2003 at Wakefield High School in Raleigh, North Carolina, where he taught physics and AP economics. He received his PhD from North Carolina, North Carolina State University in 2008 and continued his work by developing innovative classroom strategies, um, many of which he's going to share with us today. He is also a professional musician who composes and performs educational songs with supporting material about advanced curriculum for K-12 classrooms. Popular subject areas include algebra, chemistry, and U.S. history. His songs and related materials can be found in Discovery Education Streaming. Dr. McCannum is an independent educational consultant who provides professional services including keynote speeches, presentations, curriculum development, and a variety of training programs. I have the incredible opportunity to work with and learn from Dr. Lodge during the 2010 Discovery Educator Network Summer Institute, which was held in Boston. He taught the approximately 125 then attendees how to make paper slide videos, do one take videos, and how to integrate music into all our curriculum areas. We are extremely honored and thrilled to have Dr. Lodge with us today. So, Dr. Lodge, our newbie question for you is, why is movement and music important for learning? Should I answer that now, or can that be a, um, a slow play answer? Whatever you prefer, but that's usually, they, our guests usually answer the newbie question and then go on to their presentation. Gotcha. Uh, the, the presentation is actually about the answer to this question, so it'll be a little bit more long-winded than a, the short answer, but uh, why is music and movement so important for learning? It taps into uh, a number of aspects of student interest and the student brain. It's a powerful series of strategies, especially in combination. And thank you, I uh, thank you, Paula, uh, for the introduction. And I can't believe it's been uh, five and a half years since that summer institute. That's incredible. Uh, Peggy, thank you so much for including me. And it's nice to see. So I'm just like clicking through the uh, the the room here, and it's nice to see some people. Of course, uh, <clears throat> I recognize a number of names, so it's great to see you all. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for allowing me to talk a little bit about my music and some other things. So these are my slides that I'm going to go through uh, and I just want to do a quick overview to let you know where we're going and where we'll end up with this presentation. I want it to be active uh, and it'll be clear why I want it to be active uh, here in, in a few moments. But I'm going to kick it off so if you look at the uh, the first slide here. I'm going to kick it off. I'm going to do a, tw a little Twitter contest over the next 40, 45, 50 minutes, something like that. So I'll explain that in a moment. And then I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to share a little bit of uh, some, some resources and where to find some of my music. I'm going to talk about paper slide videos. I'm going to talk about where you can find some paper slide videos. I'm going to do an activity where I'm going to challenge you to create a, a sample of a paper slide video yourself and then share that out. So if you can gather a piece of paper, a marker, or something like that, uh, you'll, you'll uh, require that. And then your cell phone is fine for just taking a, a quick picture. And I'll ask you to share that on Twitter if you uh, are able to do that. I'm going to talk a little bit about brain research. I'm going to talk about how to balance technology use and movement in the classroom. 
uh, show you some examples of some, some student work, and then I'm going to challenge you to get up and get moving a little bit, even during a webinar. Uh, Any time we have students in a scenario where we're uh, teaching them, and this is a this is a, a scenario. You are my classroom, and I am your teacher for the next 45 or 50 minutes. I'm going to get you up and moving at least a little bit to get your brains uh, working and active. Uh, even a webinar should include uh, movement activities, and then, and then I'm going to close it by talking about some efficiency issues referencing some of my work with the flipped classroom. So uh, let's begin with the Twitter contest. I'm going to be having a Twitter contest over the next 45 minutes and I call this Twitter contest uh, I'll sing your name and it's quite simple. I'm going to be sharing a lot of resources, strategies, ideas, videos over the next little while and every time you Tweet at Pocket Lodge with a response, or you know, you can you can have the link of the video and then a response to the video, or whatever resource I'm sharing, uh, or really anything. If you just if you have a question, if you have uh, an idea you want to share, anytime you tweet at Pocket Lodge or reply to a tweet that's at Pocket Lodge, your name gets thrown into a hat. And at the end of the 45 minutes, I will pick a name at random out of that hat, and I will sing your name. It's as simple as that. And uh, if we could share the link to uh, the, this uh, this example, this was one that I did just a couple of days ago at the Denapalooza here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And you can hear me sing the name of, I think it's Amanda Lockhart, if I'm not mistaken. So just take a, it's about a 20 second video, take a second just to watch that. One, two, three. Amanda Lockhart, Amanda Lockhart, yeah, 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 yeah. Amanda Lockhart, Amanda Lockhart, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so just uh, for the future, for future reference, we'll be doing some of this back and forth, clicking out to watch a resource and responding to that somehow. So if you didn't get a chance to click on the link, we're going to put the links in the chat window. Um, so when I reference that, you can look at the chat window, click on the link, watch the resource, and then uh, move on from there. Uh, and again, if you didn't get a chance to see that, it's in the chat window. You can go back later. Uh, not super critical, but that's a uh, just, I'll try to do something as awesome as that video uh, for your name if you win this contest. Again, uh, Twitter contest, the more you tweet, the more chances you have to win. I started playing music on the left. You'll see a picture of me uh, climbing up on a piano bench. I, I, can't, I don't know how old I was. I don't remember doing that. I was too little. But I've been surrounded by music my entire life. I started playing violin when I was two years old, started playing cello when I was eight years old, and then subsequently throughout my life I've learned a number of different instruments that I still uh, continue to play. And I just want to tell you a quick story about uh, something that helped really inform my work in music and in education and help direct how I live my life. When I was nine years old and playing the cello, and that's the far picture on the right, I wasn't the happiest cello player in the world. I, I, you could say that I didn't really enjoy playing cello, I didn't enjoy playing music all that much. Uh, I think what it was is I didn't enjoy being told what to do. I didn't enjoy reading music. I didn't enjoy the structure of lessons. I just wanted to do my own thing, as I think a lot of nine-year-olds would rather do. But what I would, uh, my dad was a record producer and studio owner in Chicago where I grew up. And we had a recording studio in the basement of the house. So I was, every day, I was directed to go practice cello for a half an hour. And other than being arbitrary, I, I didn't really enjoy this task. And I would do everything, including uh, having temper tantrums to try to get out of it. And I was kind of a nightmare little child, a nightmare little nine-year-old. <clears throat> and so I would, my mom would say, you need to go down and practice your cello for a half an hour. So I would go down in the basement, which is where the recording studio was, and I would, whatever piece I was working on, I would really focus for just a couple of minutes, and I would play it perfectly. 
as perfect as I could, but I would record myself. Like I'd pull up a microphone from the recording studio and I would record myself playing this and then I would simply rewind the tape. It was tape back then. This was in the, uh, this was in the 80s. I would rewind the tape and then for half an hour I would keep uh, just playing the tape over and over and over and over and over. So my mom is upstairs and she... Uh, it, she would think that I'm practicing, and I would do that until the half an hour is up. I'd go back upstairs, and my mother would say, oh, thank you very much for practicing, and I would respond with, oh, yeah, no problem. Anyway, so a, a couple things there, though. I, I Immediately, I did it to kind of get out of practicing because I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy the repetition. I didn't enjoy repeating myself because I was, I was kind of talented at playing music, and I didn't like arbitrarily just... The, the whole notion of, oh, just play it again, like, threw me into temper tantrums. Like, wh why am I playing this again? I, it, it was perfect. I don't need to play it again. Um, so that would, that would really bug me. <clears throat> and anyway, so, but this informed a lot. And it's, there's a lot more to this, this story than just being silly and trying to get out of practicing and using technology to, you know, loop my practice so I didn't have to keep playing it over and over. Because a couple things happen. First, using the mindset of I'm going to record what I'm doing. The first thing I had to do was I really had to focus on the content. I had to focus on the song that I was working on to get it good enough so when I repeated it, it, it sounded good back to back. Because if I just messed up real bad, then my mom would be like, well, you just practiced the wrong thing. Go do it again. So I had to do a good job to begin with. I had to really focus and do a good job because there were, it was high stakes. That time I played through the song was a high stakes um, event, unlike just arbitrarily playing it many, many times. The second thing is upon listening, so I would record myself and then I would be in the room replaying it and listen listening to myself back over and over and over. And I didn't know, know this at the time, but brain research supports this, that uh, the mirror neurons in our brain uh, when upon listening to ourselves back, or more specifically watching ourselves play something back, we actually learn a lot by doing that. It's not just going through our head and, and worthless. Like listening to and watching ourselves back is actually critical for learning. So uh, fast forward 30 years, and I spend a lot of my life in front of the camera doing the same thing, not in a temper tantrum, uh, uh, mindset at all, but I love it. I absolutely love playing and recording music. I love being in front of the camera, uh, and I love what that means. I love the disequilibrium that that brings, the challenge of consistently, constantly evaluating myself, because it's, it's the same thing I was doing when I was nine, only now I do it on my terms. I, I'm, no one ever tells me, like, oh, you have to play this again or you have to do this. Like, I do it on my terms, and I've really embraced this concept. And I truly believe that uh, to reach your potential at something, to reach your potential at playing music or speaking or teaching, it is absolutely critical to constantly evaluate yourself. And, and this is not new. I mean, John Dewey in the 30s, right? Uh, so he started talking about reflective practice and what it means to actually make real change to your practice. You can't just teach for an hour, walk out of the room and, and pat yourself on the back and be like, I'm, I'm so awesome. I'm amazing. You know, just like you can't sit down for an hour and practice music and walk out of the room and be like, oh my, I'm such a good musician. John Dewey would say, no, you have to think about your practice. You have to spend time and say, okay, what, ha what really happened? What, what can I really do to improve? And the high-definition cell phones in our pockets have changed that game immensely. It was, it's an amazing shift. And I feel like we haven't even started to really tap into that. But the, the fact that we have HD video cameras in our pockets changes the world to a point that I, I can't even really process, but I get to experience it every day. Because thinking about your practice, if I sit down and play music for an hour and then spend 15 minutes and think about it, I'll lie to myself. If I go teach a lesson for an hour with students about uh, aggregate supply 
and then spend 15 minutes afterwards. I'll lie to myself and I'll say, oh, everything went really, really well. It was really, really good. Um, you want to know the truth. You want to really evaluate yourself, film yourself, because that doesn't lie. You watch yourself back and most of the time, well, I mean, there are a lot of different reactions that happen. And over time, after you filmed, as I've done, after you filmed thousands, thousands of videos and watched them back, um, you start seeing yourself for who you really are. And that's really important as a human being, and it's important as a professional and, and really at almost any profession to really know yourself. So I've spent years and years and thousands and thousands of hours uh, really evaluating myself as a musician. And how this plays out in the education world is uh, one of the things I'm extraordinarily passionate about is using my talents to create content-rich songs. And all of my content songs about social studies, language arts, English, um, and science can be found in Discovery Education streaming. Just go to discoveryeducation.com if you have access to Discovery, of course. And then you can just find all my materials by searching Lodge McCammon, and you can scroll through and see all the different topics. Uh, if you do not have Discovery Education, uh, uh, most of my songs are available on my website at lodgemccammon.com to uh, review and, 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 uh, and look at and listen to for free, of course. So you can check that out as well. But I've spent years trying to create content-rich songs, picking up where I thought um, uh, Schoolhouse Rock sort of left off. I, I describe when people ask what I do with music and how it connects with education, many times I'll end up saying the sentence, well, you remember Schoolhouse Rock, right? And they say, of course, yes. And I say, well, I do sort of a new version of that, an updated version. And what I mean by that is I usually write songs that are for middle school and high school level, which is, which is different. And there, there's not a lot of content music out there for those areas. Most of it is elementary. And Schoolhouse Rock was elementary focused. I also tried to do something else with music because at this point um, in the conversation, uh, uh, many people will say to me, oh yeah, you know, I, I learn a lot through music. You know, I remember learning, for example, on the bottom of the screen here, this uh, tour of the state's official music video. Now, this is a newer music video, and you can search this on YouTube if you actually want to hear uh, this, this, uh, or if you want to watch this video. Uh, I, I saw this online a few a few months ago, and I thought it was interesting. But most people say, "Oh yeah, yeah, you know, I learned my ABCs." this way. Like, I, oh yeah, I use music all the time, or I, I use music when I was learning all the time. I learned my ABCs, or I learned the capital of my states, or I learned the states in order for the state song, and then they'll sing me this song, which is very cool. Uh, and, and that is one way to use music in the classroom. Uh, that is not, uh, I try to, my interest is, is sort of elevating the use of music in the classroom because that could ease, that could be uh, under the umbrella, those types of songs are under the umbrella of mnemonics. They are meant for students to memorize things. And music is really helpful in that respect. It, it, it's, you know, catchy. It's sort of this universal language and, you know, it's easier for students to memorize a song than it is to memorize probably a series of definitions from a worksheet or from a page. So great. That's, that's fine. That's, that's, Really, that's really cool. But mnemonic learning, memorization, is uh, lower level thinking. It's low level thinking. And I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just, you know, memorizing a bunch of facts is, is fairly low level. What I try to do, and in the top picture here, is a, a video, a song that I created called uh, Cities of Gold. And it's the history of Arizona. It goes through the, the information on the history of Arizona. And it's part of my 50 states album. I'm writing one song about every state in the United States, covering the basic history, geography, and economic foundation. And it is a paper slide video, and I'll talk a little bit more about this paper slide video in a moment. Um, but I consider this, or what I want to really contribute to the music in the classroom movement is I want to create songs that have lyrics that push students to higher order thinking. If you think about it this way, I want to create rigorous content, um, 
uh, music, rig rigorous content-based lyrics, directly opposed to the mnemonic learning of memorizing, for instance, the state capitals. Uh, my songs challenge students to interpret the lyrics. It's not just a list of facts. Like you wouldn't, if you sing along with the song and memorize the song, you're only going to get a small portion of the real meaning. Uh, to get at the real meaning of the songs, they require explication. They require discussion. They require a teacher to lead students through the deeper level meaning of the information found in the lyrics. So again, the distinction is, is very important to me uh, that there's mnemonic learning, which is memorizing through music, and there's more interpretive and explicative, is that the word? Uh, so ex, uh, explicating the lyrics of a song which get at the deeper meaning, so lower order thinking or higher order thinking. Um, <clears throat> so uh, again, more rigorous types of songs. So let's jump into that a little bit uh, and get to, I'm going to show you an example of one of these songs. I'm going to have you watch it and then give me a little bit of feedback on that. But the song that I'm about to show you is is illustrated through a paper slide video and I think we were I think we were like 50 or close to 50 50 on who'd done a paper slide video before and a paper slide video is as easy as it's sim as, as simple as it seems it was a style of video that when I was at North Carolina State University a number of years ago I started a project called the Fizz project and the whole point of the project was to design video strategies for the classroom that anyone could start using tomorrow. And the paper slide video strategy was and is the most popular strategy uh, that came out of the FIS project because it is a way for teachers to instantly challenge students to give feedback, teach information back, share their voice, share their ideas by holding a camera straight down at a flat surface, creating some content on a piece of paper and sliding that content in on a one take video, meaning I hit record, we slide this stuff in, we talk about it, we hit stop, and the product is finished. So what I'm about to show you is a paper slide video. And it's the one that I was referencing before. It is on the history of Arizona. And a couple of uh, notes here. Uh, my 50 States album, I am working uh, with my parents on this. We have finished 23 of the 50 States so far. All of those songs can be found on YouTube and in Discovery streaming along with a number of the paper slide music videos. And I call these paper slide music videos because instead of creating information on paper and then talking about that while the paper slides in. The music will be playing while the paper slides in, but it's still a one take video. Now, this video is called the Cities of Gold. Again, it's from my 50 States album. And this paper slide video was designed by a children's book illustrator named Jan Maser, who's an absolute genius. Uh, and an amazing, amazing artist. So you'll see this art unfold as this video goes through and it's two minutes and 50 seconds. And the point of these paper slide videos are to be shown to students uh, to demonstrate what good looks like in a paper slide video and then challenge them to create their own. So let's go ahead and spend two minutes and 50 seconds to click out to that YouTube link which is in the chat right now and we'll come back in about three minutes and talk about this a little bit more. Mark goes to Niza, first European here in 1539. Coronado's search for the cities of gold didn't leave him far behind. Still Spain developed this territory till Mexico said, hey, we're fine. Nuevo California, apart till a war with these United States. Mexico they lost and what paid off. 1848, giving up the land in our southwest that would later confederate. So much more than the old school western half of New Mexico. Arizona, the copper state where the Grand Canyon shows. Arizona, we got the 48th last contiguous roll. And Phoenix, our city of gold. Our city of gold. North Arizona, we've got the forests, mountains, and the Colorado Plateau. The Grand Canyon is picturesque, moderate temperatures and some snow. Then in the South Basin Ridge Desert, continues into Mexico, a Southwest state. 
where we can meet at the quad point at the four corners where colorado and new mexico and utah with us collide we have some southern desert borders in the east we have alpine so much more than the old school western half of new mexico arizona the copper state where the grand canyon shows we got the 48th the last contiguous world and phoenix our city of gold our city of gold Tales, carved on a trunk of a Pablo Verde in the hot, dry sun of the Sonoran Desert, just south of Tucson. Oh, while a cactus wren lifts out a warning in the North Canyons and glides over a field of saguaro blossoms. Copper and cotton were the economic kings After the 20s, tourism boomed from dude ranches like Flying V Experienced the old west with real cowboy amenities Were air-conditioned So after the Second World War, the people flocked Snowbirds or retirement for vacation Or a ski stop, copper cotton, cattle, citrus climate The five seas, yeah we've got a lot So much more than the old school western half of New Mexico Arizona, the copper state where the Grand Canyon shows Arizona. We got the 48th, the last contiguous roll And Phoenix, our city of gold, our city of gold Yeah, Arizona Jan Maser is an absolute genius We've done a handful of... Uh, those videos and right uh, so Jan Jan's incredible we've done five of the 23 videos so far in this paper slide methodology in this paper slide strategy those five can be found in discovery education if you again log in and go to uh, uh, Lodge McCammon they can find that list or if you can type in Lodge McCammon paper slide you can also find them there uh, they can also be found on YouTube, of course, so you can just uh, find them on YouTube uh, by typing in Lodge McCammon Paper Slide or go to my YouTube channel. Now, I would like to challenge you to do something. I want this to be a little more active. I've been talking for a long time now, and now I want you to create something and, and share it. So uh, what I want you to do is I want you to listen to this song. Uh, one of my popular songs in Discovery Streaming is called Natural Satellites. It's about the solar system. So we're going to have a link uh, to Natural Satellites here in a moment. And what I want you to do is listen to the song. It's 2 minutes and 50 seconds long. And then I want you to create one paper slide image that has something that illustrates something in that song. And it can be anything you want, any image you want. Keep it very, very simple. And then I want you to take a picture of that image that you created, and I want you to tweet that out. Uh, you don't have, if you don't have a Twitter account or if you're not tweeting things, that's fine. Uh, just go ahead and do that anyway. Just, uh, just draw out your image just so you have that experience of doing it. And I will uh, wrap that up in a moment after we do that. So uh, it's going to take about two minutes and 50 seconds to watch the video, and I'll give you about a minute a minute and a half after that to create your image and tweet that out. Again, keep it incredibly, incredibly simple and it can be anything you'd like. So uh, the link is in the chat window. So uh, it's under Natural Satellite Solar System, Dr. Elijah McCammon. So again, go ahead and click on that. And as you're watching, uh, think about what image you want to create and draw that out take a picture of it, and if you have the ability to tweet, go ahead and do so. The Greeks thought the Earth was the center of the solar system, the sun and moon were planets. They thought all the mass in the outer space and darkness had revolved around us. Now we know the Earth's a planet, one of eight around a star thanks to the telescope and Copernicus. They were right about the moon in orbit, in orbit, yeah, that moon revolves around us. 
There's a star in our solar system we call the sun Not all the planets and asteroids and comets around This curved path around the hydrogen and helium On this orbit we survive a solar energy life Hey, moons, you orbit planets, be our natural satellites It's planets in order From the sun with mass and gravity to make them round People should be pretty much done watching the video, and if you want to just take about a minute to draw something out, you should have been thinking about that while you while you watch the video. So, if you want to take a minute to draw something out, tweet it out. That'd be great, and we will pause for one more minute while that activity goes on. Alrighty, we're going to we're going to move on. If you had a chance to start working toward that, great. If you tweeted it out, great. Uh, we'll take a look at those. Uh, I will take a look at those. Uh, <clears throat> keep in mind that the point here is not necessarily that you created something or you created something beautiful or you created something and tweeted it out. The point is how we use music in the classroom, um, how we challenge students to use it in a different way. We want to get away from just playing a song for students and letting it wash over them. Just like we want to get away from just lecturing the students and letting that information wash, wash over them. We should have something for them to do, something for them to create, a purpose for them listening to this. And even if you didn't uh, create an image, even if you didn't tweet it out, totally fine, you listened and watched these lyrics or you listened to this song in a different way than if I just said, oh, just listen to the song. You said, oh, I'm going to be responsible for making sense out of this. I'm going to be responsible for making my version of this. I'm going to be responsible for creating something. And that heightens the level of awareness for any lesson, even listening to a song. So in that spirit, we're going to even move further in this concept of listening to music or participating in music in a heightened state, more than just, I'm going to play a song for my kids and then move into the lesson. We're going to say, we're going to get enveloped in a song. We're going to get completely involved in a song. And getting involved in a song can move past the paper slide video concept. Paper slide video can be a very powerful strategy. but we can move even beyond that and even make it uh, learning with music in the classroom more powerful. And how we can do that is a natural human response to music, especially music we like and especially certain kinds of music, 
is movement, is dancing specifically, or really any kind of movement, motion, uh, uh, swaying left and right, raising our arms. It is a human response to music. And not that the physical benefits, uh, the health benefits, are, are great for movement, are very, very important, especially given the state of our country. But there are academic benefits that I really would like to talk about. This image right here uh, is a very powerful image. This was taken from an article I read a little while back. And the article is called, Exercise is Medication for ADHD. Exercise is medication for ADHD. Well, that informs a lot of what we do. Uh, and it's kind of incredible that, that's, uh, that that might be the case. So on the left, you see a brain that has, uh, a student brain that has gone through some exercise. On the right, you see a student brain is sitting um, without exercise. And we, want, we might wonder why we want the brain to be more active like on the left. Why is this so important? Well, we know from research that if we can get the brain to look like this on the left, it can in increase cognition, creativity, attention. It can improve behavior, increase student uh, achievement, and increase memory. It's a slam dunk. It's an amazing strategy. Just get students up and moving. And the article was suggesting it's medication for ADHD. It's an it's a incredibly powerful strategy. So what does this look like? Uh, how do we really make this happen, and why is it so important? I would like to play you a 3 minute and 18 uh, second video that gives an overview of why this is important and how we can start moving in this direction, no pun intended, moving in this direction, uh, in our classroom. So if you would take a look at Balance, the digital, uh, digital and movement based learning, the link that will be popping up here in the chat window momentarily. Great. Or Paula, I'm sorry, Paula, that was a great idea. So if you would, just, just to practice what we preach here, um, if you're sitting down, uh, please just stand up for this video, for this three minutes and 18 seconds. Stand up and kind of maybe sway side to side a little bit. Just get, get the blood moving. Uh, get the blood not pooling in your lower half. Get the blood going to your brain while you watch this three minute and 18 second video, and we'll see you back afterwards. As more and more screen-based devices are being used in school, we need to make sure we are allowing students to exercise their bodies, not just their fingers, during every class period. We need to provide a balance. It seems like wherever I travel to different conferences, schools, and districts, people are talking about digital learning plans. They talk about purchasing and integrating things like iPads, laptops, and tablets into the classroom. Even entire states are designing plans for transitioning to completely digital environments. This seems like an exciting idea. Imagine how cool it would be if every student had an internet-connected, screen-based device to enhance their learning. I am confident that day will soon be here and that very smart people are working on ways of ensuring that the technology will generate positive learning outcomes for all students. However, I want to talk about balance. Over the past 10 years, the amount of time that children spend on internet-connected, screen-based devices outside of school has sharply risen. Research has shown some negative impacts resulting from children spending too much time on these devices. Impacts like damage to eyesight and increased likelihood of attention issues. This evidence has made its way into the popular press, prompting many parents to take notice and implement strategies to mitigate these negative effects, such as not allowing children under a certain age to use these devices and limiting screen time. When I hear about a classroom, school, district, or state going one-to-one, -one, making sure every student has a screen-based device, it worries me. There are some benefits for students having these devices for learning, but fundamentally these initiatives are saying, during the seven hours your child will be in school, we are planning to significantly increase the amount of screen time, the very thing you have been trying to limit at home. Just imagine your child being required to look at a screen for an additional three to five hours every day, or even more. Again, I think some of this is inevitable, but we need to plan for the impact this will have on our children. We need a balance.
Along with every digital learning plan, there should be a movement-based learning program, just like what parents are doing at home. Time that children are spending on a device should be matched with time spent up and moving around, exercising their bodies. One of the benefits of using technology is that it can provide a more efficient way of delivering the information to students via things like video lectures, so the technology can free up class time that can be spent on student movement and exercise. There's been a raft of research that suggests that exercise and movement is critical not only for the health of a child, but for learning as well. Research shows that if we can get students up and moving during class time, it will improve their cognition, attention, memory, and academic performance. Movement has also been linked to decreasing symptoms of ADHD, obesity, and depression. But perhaps the best thing about integrating movement and exercise into the classroom every day is that, unlike the integration of technology, it does not cost anything. So as we move forward with our digital learning plans, let's not forget the much-needed balance that a movement-based learning program can provide. Great, we should be back. And that video referenced a number of things, including getting students up and moving, and also this idea of using technology to be more efficient with our time so we can actually get students up and moving, which is what I want to use the last few minutes here to discuss. This is a music video, a one take music video, same strategy as the paper slider, same technology as the paper slide, only we're not pointing the camera or cell phone at a flat surface. Now we're pointing it at a wall and allowing students to interact kinesthetically or physically or kinetically with the content. This is a song about cells. It's called Afraid of the Dark. Uh, one of my uh, more popular science songs in Discovery Streaming, and this is some students, uh, middle school students from Michigan who created kinesthetic movements that uh, outline or that help illustrate the content. So if we can just watch uh, maybe about a minute of this, you'll get, you'll get an idea. So let's just, let's just uh, watch a minute of this video. You'll, you'll see the kids be very active and engaged while uh, acting out this information about cells. Well, I have a theory Schleiden, Schwann, and Verco agree with that all living things have basic cells Yeah, Anton believes it The first to see it Hook was wowed by a cork When he put it under a microscope Plants have cellular walls But we don't need them at all Our little membranes are flexible and strong They pack their vacuoles in With chloroplast they begin Collecting sunlight Afraid of the dark again Now I gain control the joystick and manage the nucleus Deciding what comes in there and who should leave its exclusive access Genetic glow sticks provided by the chromatin The nucleus brings the ribs Plants have cellular walls, but we don't need them at all Our little membranes are flexible and strong They pack their vacuoles in with chloroplast they begin Collecting sunlight, afraid of the dark Again, outside the envelope, waiting in the cytoplasm The mitochondria treat you like a meal While they try to convert you into something real tasty The longer you stand, waiting in the cytoplasm Lysosomes look at you like your bacteria They're little round structures filled with chemicals that don't feel They're aiming to break you down La -da -na 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 -na. Put them in these vesicles and fill the need. Plants 
fancy cellular walls, but we don't need them at all. Our little membranes are flexible and strong. They pack their vacuoles in with chloroplast, they begin collecting sunlight, afraid of the dark again. Na -na 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 -na. Great, and you can finish watching that if you'd like to uh, after the session is over, but since we're running a little bit uh, short on time, and I want to make sure that if there are questions, I address the questions and leave a few minutes for that if we could bring it back to the classroom live <clears throat> uh, window here. And uh, so what happens with those students is they get into groups and collaborate and talk about the content critically. They design movements that illustrate directly, uh, the, illustrate the content. Those are not arbitrary movements. They are things that, okay, if we talk about cells, we should raise our arms like this. If we talk about these types of cells, we should structure it like this. Um, critical conversations for them to process the information. And again, it goes back to that idea that we want to challenge students to go beyond just listening to content. We want them to create their own version of that content. So you can find a lot of different uh, one-take music videos on my website and on YouTube and other places. One of the strategies that I use, something that I'm passionate about creating to help teachers move in this direction and get students moving more in the classroom is I create something called kinesthetic lectures. And you'll see a little screen grab here of one of my kinesthetic lectures, uh, uh, kinesthetic lecture series for that song that we listened to before about the solar system. And these are lectures because I, on video I go through the information, uh, talk about the information, talk about the lyrics, and then I directly connect that content, the, that lecture, to kinesthetic movement. So it's a, it's a follow along kind of thing. And the idea is that students follow along with my kinesthetics. And then it's much easier for the teacher then to say, OK, now you've seen that example, create your own. Take it to the next level. Uh, just it's scaffolding. And I, what I found years ago is that just having or telling teachers or suggesting to teachers, rather, that they get students up and moving using music, uh, they struggled a lot with that because they needed scaffolding because it's a very different way to approach learning uh, than we typically see in our classroom. So it provides a uh, scaffold for starting to use movement uh, in, uh, in a high level, so higher order thinking skills in music and then tying movement to that. Now, the last thing I really want to talk about is uh, what most people would have in their minds at, at this point, which is, OK, well, maybe I'm convinced, maybe I'm not. Maybe I like that brain search, maybe a, a brain research, maybe I didn't. Um, but really what it comes down to is I, I don't have time to do any of this stuff in my classroom. Like, uh, there's just there's no time to fit it in. I can't spend a class period having students get up and move and, and do a music video because I'm, I'm just the pacing guy. I'm crazy. just have to get through all my content, and it doesn't, you know, uh, it doesn't really fit uh, ha having them do a whole period or two periods or three periods of, of class time doing this sort of thing. Uh, in response to that, I would like to uh, have you watch this video. It's a little over a minute long. And keep in mind that if I was to go through this same information live right now, just talk through it, like explain the data on this screen, um, with the same content, this would probably take me about six minutes because you know, I've done it before. It takes about six minutes live to explain this information, and this video is about a minute and a minute, maybe a minute and a half. So keep that in mind as we watch this video. Take a minute or so and do that. We sent out a survey asking teachers who have recorded and published their lecture content to tell us the difference between how long a live lecture used to take compared to how long their video lectures are. And most of these teachers are ha, have gone through the training program that we have created. Um, so we had middle school, uh, elementary, middle, high school, and college professors all participate in this survey. We had 127 teachers reply in total. And here is a summary of their responses. So in elementary school, the elementary school teachers reported that 
the average length of their live lecture was 23.4 minutes and the average length of a video lecture on the same topic that used to take them 23.4 minutes is 5 minutes. In middle school the average live lecture is 38.3 minutes their average video lecture is 8.5 minutes in high school an average live lecture is 37.8 minutes and their average video lecture is 10.5 minutes and in college their average live lecture is 54 minutes and their average video lecture is 19.8 minutes huge huge benefits and efficiency from from recording your lecture content basically in elementary school the ratio is five to one for every five minutes you do live lecture that can be summarized in a one minute video for middle and high school it's about four to one and college is three to one the other interesting thing we're finding is that so for college the ratio is three to one also for like faculty meetings staff meetings in school it's about a three to one ratio for uh, live talking compared to what could be condensed to a video and also professional development uh, is usually about three to one as well when I was eight years old or nine years old I didn't know I was going to be paving the way for my work in uh, creating rigorous learning environments and efficient learning environments using very simple technology to capture and record myself so I find that and other things fascinating but thank you very much for tuning in I appreciate you being attentive and being active in this experience uh, we have a few minutes for questions or we have uh, uh, one or two minutes for questions actually if there are questions I'm happy to answer probably one or two of them if you want to contact me through email or on Twitter I will also answer questions that way or any other way you can get a hold of me I'm happy to do that Thanks so much, Lodge. Yes, we did have a number of questions. Um, early on, Peggy asked, I know how important the practice of um, practice is for whatever activity you're doing. But what about the idea about, quote, use it or lose it, unquote? If you practice and learn well and don't use it for 15 to 20 years, will you still remember it? Uh, that's a complicated question and that would determine uh, what the skill is, what your level was when you were playing or practicing it, and who mm -hmm. you are as a human being and what your capacity for learning and memory would be, which is different for every person. Sure. So no real answer to that question other than to actually try it out. Um, for your Discover Ed, Discovery Ed song, sorry, uh, do you have to have a paid subscription to Discovery Education? see those discovery yeah I'm, thank you for that question uh, discovery education is a pay for service that mm -hmm. district schools and districts can purchase from discovery education as a teacher it, it's my understanding that as an individual teacher you cannot buy it your school or district has to purchase it but all the songs uh, and some of the materials can still be found on the website for free okay And I think this was the uh, satellite and uh, planet song. Uh, that was a lot of language for people who don't speak English as their primary language. Um, do you accommodate them? Do you slow it down for them? Uh, it, it, since, it, since it's a video, yeah, you, I mean, you would obviously, if, you, if I had an ESL student or a few ESL students in my class, I would. Uh, allow them to watch it multiple times, which I can mm -hmm. certainly allow them to do. I would differentiate instruction by providing them possibly with uh, a more extensive lyric sheet. I would spend more time with them, sit down with them, and possibly read it to them slowly. I would have maybe a peer sit down with them and read it to them slowly and discuss the content. Of course, all, all those all those you know fundamental differentiated instruction activities right. we would do if we had a student uh, that needed that kind of um, assistance in, in our classroom. Right, and as far as the practicing part goes, Peggy was thinking about playing the piano or something like that. I, I, I don't understand the question. Oh, that, that went back to the use it or lose it, practicing something and then years later trying it again, like playing the piano. 
Sure, that would fit into the answer that I gave in terms okay. of like how 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 master how much of a master were you at the piano when you learned it? What is your personal capacity in your person in your brain for holding on to that kind of thing? And it's very sure. it's a it's a case by case okay. basis. Yeah, it's a complicated yeah. answer. Okay. Um, if students don't use Twitter, what are some alternatives to the drawing than sharing their interpretation of the ideas in the song? Interesting question. I, I never use Twitter in my classrooms. Mm -hmm. I don't use Twitter to share information with my classes. I don't use Twitter uh, for any purpose. I use Twitter in things like this because it's an easy way we can all share with each other and it's a social way of sharing and it's something that we were using anyway for this particular thing. Um, in the classroom for that activity, and I'm sorry I didn't make this clear when we did it, I would have students independently or in groups create those images and discuss mm -hmm. the images, discuss the content. We would film the paper slide video using the images they created in the classroom. We'd film it in the classroom. We would watch it in the classroom. And then after that series of events, me as the teacher, I would decide whether the paper slide video is good enough to be published. If it is, then I would publish it in whatever appropriate place exists in my school district that is supported by my school district to publish it. Uh, in Wake County, that would be YouTube. Okay. We watched a video about live lectures versus recorded. Um, that does definitely, watching the video definitely saves time for the students. How about for the teacher? How much time does it take the teacher to create the video? Again, it's going to differ based on um, a, num a number of things. Having, having worked with you know, thousands of teachers on this exact thing, um, mm -hmm. there are lots of factors, right? right. For, first of all, yes, it takes time. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, you know, if it takes time to create this environment for your students, um, and I liken it, you know, the feedback I've gotten from teachers who have done that, and I think about it in terms of becoming transparent teachers. Yeah, it's not. There's no easy way of doing it. It's a huge shift in your practice, mm -hmm. um, and there's no, there's no app for this. There's no app right. for going through the reflective process of creating, evaluating yourself, creating, evaluating yourself, and then offering that information to students. It's a, it's a very, very um, uh, uh, significant process. Now, it's going to mm -hmm. depend how long it takes. It's going to depend upon whether you know your content. It depends on uh, whether you're able to express the content. It depends on mm -hmm. your comfort in front of the camera the first couple of times. Um, but all those things are, everybody's different in those aspects. Um, but uh, what, I will, what I'll say to the, this question is uh, try one. One. Mm -hmm. Don't think about it and like, oh my gosh, I have so much content. No, no. One. Just, yeah. just do one and see how long it takes you. I, I, it won't take more than an hour. Uh, right. So just, just try one and then show it to your students. See what they think. Uh, and then use the freed up time afterwards to uh, to get them up and moving. Get them, give them a couple questions and take them on a walk. It's something as simple as that. And I, I think if you do one lesson like that, you'll be hooked. It'll be worth your time that you invest to get better at it, but also it'll be worth your time because the students will, will love it and you'll love it. You get to take a walk too. You get to be up and moving more. You get to be in an environment where they're happy and they're engaged and their memories are, are active and their brains are firing, their cognitive level is increasing. Sure. And it also probably depends on how it is you're trying to make the video too. Uh, if you do the, the mm -hmm. one take away and or if you try to, to make it like a, 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 an actual production, it would be a different amount of time for both I would think. Sure, and I would, I would highly suggest that if you're on the fence about this, do not produce, use the right. one-take video mentality. Use the, one take. Yeah. The, the, re the research even suggests that, that the more informal one-take strategy is more engaging for students mm -hmm. than a highly produced video. Sure. That's great. Those were the questions that I was able to capture, except one that I think, I'm not sure, he, he logged in and then got dropped. Somebody asked if you had done a state video on Oklahoma yet. Not yet. Not yet. That's one of the 
27 that you don't have. Uh, Indeed. So those were all the questions. Again, thanks so much, Lodge, for sharing with us today. Thank you, Peggy and Paul and everyone else. I really appreciate it. So I will turn the mic over to Peggy. Thank you so much, Lodge. We, our minds are spinning, and we're all going to get in there and try something. I love your 50 States project, and it's so great to hear those songs from every state. Thanks. Um, upcoming shows, we have one more show before our winter break. Hope you'll join us next week for a great Hour of Code follow-up session where Vicki Sedgwick is going to join us and give us some ideas for ways we can keep Hour of Code going all year long. And then we'll have two weeks off for winter break. And when we come back on January 9th, we'll do our year in review show to celebrate and recognize everyone who presented for us in 2015 and to welcome the new year. So I hope you'll come back and join us for all of those. And Lori, you can just wrap up with the rest of the tips. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate room. As long as your session is public, it's free. You can also nominate a featured teacher with this form. It's in the resources area of each month's live binder as well. As you exit the session, your browser should open the Classroom 2.0 Live survey form, or you can take the link in the chat box, or it's also in the live binder in the resources section. When you get to the survey, there is a place where you can request a professional development certificate. Just type your name in the field and then make sure the address is a personal email address and not a school email address because if it's a school address, it likely will be blocked. You won't receive it. There is a new link for the iTunes U collections at bit.ly. Um, the other one the other one doesn't work anymore for the video collection and audio collection at iTunes U. You also still can get the recordings via RSS feed or of course the full recordings inside the Classroom 2.0 Live website. Special thanks again to Lodge McCammon. Our, our guest today, the Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today, thanks so much for coming. <laughs>